Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. And uh, thank you very much for your enthusiasm for photos, uh, which uh, I'm sure we all share. Now, um, I am very thankful to be invited, and uh, I am very impressed with the uh, work that's gone into this conference. And I, I thank uh, Professor Rizman for that uh, introduction because it uh, ties in with what I'm going to say. You know, Macaulay uh, persuaded uh, the British Parliament to make English the dominant language, but Macaulay uh, would never have imagined what, the, what this would uh, lead and it led to similar things all throughout the empire. Uh, people took the language, transformed it, and used it for their own purposes to uh, communicate their own culture. So uh, today I want to think about the various uh, ways in which the difference, <coughs> the difference of the colonized and uh, formerly colonized and imperial countries um, can relate. Now, to start this, uh, the American, I want to suggest that uh, the way to relate is to find something, find a way of speaking that uh, is, is uh, amenable to everyone. And the American scholar Barbara Hernstein Smith has spent much time examining different ways to frame the relation between two very different enterprises, or enterprises we regard as different, science and religion. And uh, relating the difference between these two uh, discourses seems like a hopeless task, since the language of the two activities themselves dictate that a relation can only be achieved when one discourse surrenders and moves into the realm of the other. Most often, of course, it means religious discourse adopting the language of rationality, even though reason itself is a relatively recent philosophical construct. Now, Herbstein Smith calls his exercise a study of the microdynamics of incommensurability. And the most significant revelation in the study came through teaching seminars attended by people from very different cultural and scientific and religious backgrounds. By the conclusion of each semester, she says, there seemed to be a way of putting things, of describing and understanding the nature of religion, science, belief, and the relation to the That is accessible to virtually everyone. Now, the concept of difference is, of course, on our venerable topic in post-colonial studies, and the insistence on difference over diversity and established doctrine. But that's certainly to Pernstein Smith's a way of putting things acceptable to virtually everyone, alerts us to the fact that the capacity to relate or communicate difference demands an element of relatedness, or at least engagement between the different entities. Difference can only be related in a complex way. This indeed is the way in which difference is related in post-colonial cultural production. The way, that way of putting things refers to not just language, but a way of speaking, a way of arranging language, and perhaps even the way of knowing that exists beyond language. So how does a formerly colonized subject relate difference? in a way that is virtually acceptable to everyone. My answer to this is that it is, it is achieved firstly through the creative use of language, chiefly through literature, and subsequently through the power of a visual language. But before we examine the capacity of post-colonial literature to do this, to find the way of putting things, we must go to the crux of the problem, to language. Uh, language in Smith's seminar is quite uncontentious, even though the discourses appear to be entirely incommensurable. But in post-colonial context, the beginning of the problem is that 
existing between uh, the differences in the language itself. We seem to have a different, uh, a similar problem to that existing between science and religion. Communication may be held to occur only when one discourse surrenders to the other. But the way of putting things is critical because it can only occur in a shared language. And this has been a contentious issue since Anglophone post-colonial writers began to elbow their way into the field of English literature. Now, the problem with post-colonial language use can be seen in a critical moment in Shakespeare's final play, The Tempest, when we first encounter the monster Caliban. Caliban threatens to overwhelm Prospero by an assignation to people the isle with Caliban's, to which Miranda responds that he is an abhorred slave, savage, brutish, and vile. Her response is significant in the context because it reveals very clearly the distinction between othering and difference. This is where the verb relating becomes useful, because difference cannot be related unless some sense of relationship develops. This part of the interchange reminds us that the abuse that proceeds from power constructs and stereotypes rather than identifies. Identity itself is the result of dialogue, both of what we say of ourselves and what others say. But othering constructs a boundary that cannot be breached. However, when she claims that uh, she taught him language that he might know his own language, his response is one of the most memorable in literature. You taught me language, and my problem is I know how to curse. The red play rid you for learning your language. Now, this has become a familiar response to colonised peoples to centuries of linguistic and political control. The Taliban was very embodiment of the colonial subject. Many post-colonial commentators have accepted Taliban's conclusion that the colonial language is a comprehensive agent of domination. George Lang, who first wrote the issue of Pleasures of Exile, um, <coughs> believes that Prospero's language is always going to be a prison. The Taliban can never be regarded as an heir of that language, says Lang since the use of his language is no more than his way of serving prosper. Now, I hope the echoes of this are very clear to all people here who are interested in post-colonial study. But this is a curious contradiction. For Lenin to assert that Caliban will never be able to use Prosper's language for his own purposes is to deny Lenin's own achievement in writing widely read novels in English that have affected the way in which the Caliban was viewed. An alternative view to language was expressed by Jan Maltian, uh, who suggests that if Caliban is no longer part of nature, he will never be able to break out of the prison of Prospero's language. So he captures in his own and Prospero's language a culture Prospero did not create and cannot control, which he, Caliban, has recognised as his own. But in the process, the language is transformed, acquiring different meanings which Prospero never expected. Caliban becomes a bilingual. That language he shares with Prospero, and the language he has omitted from it are no longer identical. Caliban breaks out of the prison of Prospero's language. Now, Jan explicitly dates Caliban's appropriation of Prospero's culture. The successful revolt from the prism of the Prosperous language from the rise of the Negritudinous movement. But uh, the uh, process of using language, of transforming language for that purposes, is one that has gone on uh, through colonial times. And I want to suggest at this moment that post colonial doesn't mean after colonialism, it means after invasion. And post colonial reading occurs from the moment of, uh, of the imperial domination. Now, I will pass over. Let's think about language and culture. Uh, a key problem in this debate is the persistent idea that language is somehow a fixed embodiment of the essence of the culture. 
so much cultural identity is invested in language that it appears imperative to most speakers that language be a stable discourse in which ontological certainty can be guaranteed. My language constitutes the avenue of my entry into an articulately experienced world. It is the language through which I came to a family, community, a society, a nation. To all intents and purposes, my language is me. Yet my language may be used by someone who is not me, my family or culture. How then does my language identify my difference? Well, the most robust example of this argument is offered by Ngugi Rationga. He says language embodies the thought processes of public culture. And in decolonizing the mind, Ngugi states that language, any language, has a dual character. It's both a means of communication and a carrier of culture. Where English is concerned, it is largely used as a means of communication across many nationalities, but it is not the carrier of a culture and history of many of those nationalities. Well, the key question here is how does a language carry a culture? Is it impossible for a language to carry a culture different from the one in which it emerged? Obviously, what we mean by the term carry will be critical in deciding this. Juno Rachetti believes that a language can carry a different culture. I feel that English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience. But it will have to be a new English, still in full communion with the ancestral home, but altered to suit new African surroundings. Now, clearly what Nguyen and Achebe mean by the term carry are quite different things. And this points out some of the difficulty of the debate. Because many people believe that to carry does not simply mean to bear, but to embody. At the centre of this conflict is the myth that a language embodies the essence of a culture. Hence, English, whether transported into a foreign language or similar culture, is profoundly inauthentic in its true place, so it is assumed. If we were to regard an authentic language as one which somehow embodies cultural uniqueness in a way no other language could, then English would be linguistically inappropriate to the development of non-British culture. But is essence simply a loosely used metaphor, or does it lie at the heart of a profoundly erroneous assumption about language and culture? Would this essence for instance exist in every manifestation of culture? Would it exist in every instance of polydialectical speech? How exactly does a specific language convey this essence? I won't dwell on this continuing argument, except to say that in every case that we might detect a distinctive cultural feature, either language, behaviour or experience, it is not a sign of cultural essence, but of cultural difference. Each sign obtains its identity only in its difference from other signs. On this distinction, into the world of difference. Now, in this, in this theory, language is grounded in a particular cultural reality. It provides the terms by which reality may be constituted. It provides the names by which the world may be known. Its system of values, representations, and discrimination becomes a system upon which social, economic, and political discourse is grounded. But whether these are incontestable acquisitions made by or forced on the colonial language learner, whether the language learner can make cultural distinctions between languages is the real question at heart of the considerable dispute over the efficacy of writing in English. To claim that language can hold the minds of the colonised captive, as Ngubi does, when he exhorts the deep colonisation of the mind, is to deny the very capacity for resistance that his own writing invokes. Yet when we see the considerable cultural ethnography that a writer in English can produce, we see that the novelist and poet can be used as ideal models for the engagement with a dominant discourse. The question is, is it impossible for signs of cultural difference to be communicated in a dominant language? Those signs communicate difference rather than essence. The answer must obviously 
We know. In fact, the very existence of a dynamic field of post-colonial reactors in English refutes it. The science can accommodate various forms of difference, and they do this within the language by abrogating the centrality of the dominant language and appropriating the language to the structure and rhythm of another tongue. Language does not define a cultural boundary, but a region of intercommunication, a transcultural space. Unlike Caliban, the postcolonial subject steps into the space and takes control of the representation and difference, takes hold of the power of self-representation through the agency of the dominant language. Now, how then does the postcolonial subject state this difference? Uh, offer a way of putting things that opens a space um, in which readers and writers meet to relate to. How does it construct a context zone? In the post-colonial context, literature has been that way of putting things par excellence. In Ernst uh, Bloch's view, literature is so powerfully utopian because its very raison d'etre is the imagination of a different world. Literature differs from the language of social science in that it allows both writer and reader to enter the space between what may be called very different cultures, discourses, and ways of being. It does this through affect and through the interchangeability of the writer and reader functions that open up the text as a transcultural space. That space is not necessarily a shared way of seeing, but rather one in which difference may be communicated. This is a space that Lanning himself occupies, but it is one that Shakespeare would never acknowledge. This is where we begin to see the dual function in the colonial language of relating and relatedness, because in the transcultural space of literature, in what Mary Louise Pratt calls the context zone, both speaker and hearer are changed. Now, the, the, the term transcultural, like the word difference, also has a general history of post-colonial theory. It was coined in the 1940s by Cuban sociologist Fernando Ortiz uh, in relation to Afro-Cuban culture and incorporated into literary studies by a Uruguayan critic named Rama in the 1970s. Ortiz proposed the term to replace the paired concepts of acculturation and deculturation to describe the transference of culture in reductive fashion, and one imagined from within the interests of the metropolis. The contact zone has often been framed as contestatory space, but we can see it producing a more constructive dialogue, a process of intersubjective contact and mutual change. One contact zone clearly open to analysis is the transcultural text. In indigenous writing, the zone becomes increasingly subtle as writers' uh, familiarity with indigenous culture may well occur after or simultaneously with their schooling in English. The transcultural text is a space of negotiation, a heterotopic space in which the boundary between self and other blurs, a space in which meaning is negotiated, where in a sense both writer and reader are changed in constitutive pollution. But Tim is interesting here because he contends that all novels involve a cross-cultural engagement between readers and writers. He's interested in the novel because for him, the novel form provides a particularly rich medium for the many-voiced appearance of different languages. For the novelist, the object is always entangled in someone else's discourse about it. It is already present with qualification and is inseparable from the heteroglot social apperception of it. Now, I want to propose a way of looking at reading they call <coughs> constitutive reading. The dialogism of a text that Barton talks about shapes it as a social situation. It's important to see the text as a material object, a thing, because its materiality affects communication, but we must not forget that the writing is an intense 
and socially mediated act, if we accept the reality of writing as a practice, we can then understand that the text is a social situation in which the objective meanings of writing come about through a process of social accomplishment between writing and reading participants. If we understand the meaning event as a negotiation of social actors who present themselves to each other as functions in the text, we can then posit the negotiation of cultural meaning in the cross-cultural text as a transcultural event. People living in different cultures may live in totally different and even incommensurable worlds, different worlds of experience, expectation, habit, understanding and tradition. Nevertheless, meaning is accomplished between writing and reading participants in ways that may confound theories of cultural incommensurability. This is what Ernst Smith calls, in more benign terms, a way of putting things that was acceptable to everyone. The transcultural, uh, the transcultural context only is not so much a, uh, uh, was a sh a space of shared experience as a space of acknowledged difference, a space of negotiating meaning. The particularly, particular facility of that writing that uses English as a second language and invites the reader into the mental and emotional horizon of the other culture is to bridge the gap between cultures to reveal that understanding is a function of the linguistic situation. The dialectic of writing and reader functions within this situation is particularly significant. Such writing re-emphasizes the constitutive nature of the meaning of it and the varied nature of the usage in which meaning is accomplished. But the situation is rendered much more complex if the difference communicated is not entirely one's own. Well, we've, we've so far seen how difference can be apprehended in the relationship between an adopted language and another tongue, and how it can also be communicated in the transcultural space of the literary text, in which writer and reader functions meet. However, the relationship of difference need not occur between different languages, but also between different cultural realities. And Aboriginal writers, who may not have full access to an indigenous tongue, are a prime example of this. But River is wildcat forming is a novel in which the motif of the prison recurs, beginning with Wildcat's release from prison. And this imprisonment and subsequent physical and mental dislocation upon his release clearly mirrors the state of Aboriginal people in white society. He realises his Aboriginality always be outside society, outside the law, a condition of cultural orphanhood, confirmed by his lack of the father. What this novel relates is an otherness that the non-Indigenous reader will never experience. But of course, the controversy that surrounds Mabruru is that he was not Indigenous himself. So the text becomes a space of mutual acknowledgement rather than a communication of that otherness. In a curious way, the writer and reader enter a space in which difference is related. Now, while Pat Fulling and Alex Wright, um, Alexis Wright's Carpenteria are examples of what might be called pre marvo and post marvo novels. Forty years after Wildcat Fulling, Alexis Wright's monumental novel Carpenteria begins, so to speak, where Wildcat Fulling ends, with a confident sense of connection to cultural memory starts outside the prison of white society. Now Wright says, the fundamental challenge I wanted to set myself was to explore ideas that would help us to understand how to reimagine a larger space than the ones we have been forced to enclose within the imagined borders that have been forced upon us. A vast, sprawling novel, Carpenteria addresses the range of issues that affect Aboriginal life in the North. The most interesting is the way in which it begins by inserting the dreaming 
He took the contemporary text. We have one fact forming allowed us to observe the difference of Aboriginal cosmology as it affected Wildcat. Carpenteria employs language in a way that takes us, to some extent, into the Aboriginal belief system. The novel inserts without explanation the reality of the dream in the opening sections of the novel, thus announcing the relevance of Aboriginal cosmology to Australian life. Picture the creative serpent scoring deep into, scoring down through the slippery underground of the mudflats, leaving in its wake the thunder of tunnels collapsing to form deep sunken valleys, the seawater falling in the serpent's wake, swarming in a frenzy of tidal waves. Soon changed colour from ocean blue to yellow of mud. The water filled the swirling tracks uh, to form the mighty debending rivers spread across the vast plains of the country. Now, while while Wildcat Fawning discovers his interest with song, Carpenteria takes us into the cosmology of Aboriginal belief. The last sentence states it is all around in the atmosphere and is attached to the lives of the river people like skin. In that sentence, in the presence of the Aboriginal reality, the boundary between reality and myth is crossed. And the re-narration, recreation of place begins to occur. Furthermore, the description includes no concessions to the contemporary reader, for the passage simply interpolates Aboriginal reality into the contemporary English text by simply inserting the perception of place into the text. A metonymic gap is established, and the assertion of Aboriginal reality is made in the contemporary English text. Now, this is by no means unique in post-colonial writing. It unites the traditional and the modern in the same way that the Chetty introduces us to the Egwugu and things fall apart by joining on the fact that these dances in ceremonial dress, as everyone knows, are at the same time the spirit beings of Devo cosmology. But Wright's introduction to the Rainbow Serpent as a wider function for it inducts the reader into an understanding of the interdependability of dreaming and country. Both Wildcat Falling and Carpentary reveal something important about difference. It can be communicated at a level of understanding that does not require us to experience Aboriginal culture to be Aboriginal. Now, the title of uh, the title of this talk um, centers on the capacity of a shared language to communicate cultural difference. But there is a sense in which the visual language of art, a language may in many respects be seen to be generated by European tradition, also offers a transcultural space in which difference may be related. The relating of difference may involve uh, different degrees of relationship and it needs to be said that the observation of difference may not involve perfect empathy. Yet the capacity of the artist to represent difference is extremely important. This means that the transcultural space, the context zone of the creative work, may involve various degrees of relatedness. Now, Lynn Onus, uh, who died prematurely in 1996, is an Aboriginal painter who focuses on the most pressing debates affecting contemporary Aboriginal art. Hybridity versus authenticity, Aboriginality versus Australianness, high versus popular art, opposite positionality versus transformation. He's a painter who interweaves a contemporary style with images of Aboriginal culture and cosmology, and in this way relates the difference of Aboriginal culture without intruding on its sacred realities. In the Aboriginal context, the idea of reconciliation has achieved great traction, for it encompasses a range of issues such as land rights, compensation for the stolen generation, and a general acknowledgement of a brutal history. More recently, it has emerged in the Indigenous Voice to Parliament and the closing of the GAP reports. Lynn Onus is always, in one way or another, 
talking about place and history. Within these discourses, the issues of representation, dispossession, cultural displacement, marginality, mimicry, writing back to the canon, can be found to traverse individual paintings. And the issues themselves can become the subjects of Homer's particular brand of satiric and irreverent humor. Now, in some, in some respects, difference is the key to Ernest's work, particularly in that aspect I would call representing representation. Much of his work is meta-representation, and in this way manages to convey striking images of difference. Linnaeus offers the prospect of a reconciliation that comes about through transculturation, and a transculturation of a particular kind one that operates intratextually rather than between two cultures and their textual representation. This intratextual transculturation disrupts anachronistic and disempowering notions of authenticity. Ideas of authenticity lead to very frustrating paradox of originality in which contemporary artists such as Jonas, Bennett, and Moffat find themselves. Are they Aboriginal or Australian? Aboriginal Australian or Australian Aboriginal. The stereotypes of authenticity have persistently undermined the work of contemporary Aboriginal artists. But a prime example of uh, what I'm talking about, to be honest, is a uh, called Twice Upon a Time. Now, this is a constant instance of his representation of style. And all of his representations, particularly his representations of place, are about the process of representation itself. His seeing a place is always an investigation of seeing, or at least a disruption of our seeing to uncover that which, uh, that ideology which is giving a form. It is precisely that which makes his hybrid style transformative. It's multidimensional, operating in a constant field of interrogation. So the painting is a palimpsest in which uh, visual reproduction laid one over the other. Um, the representation, the visual representation of uh, the, the Billabong, laid over a uh, background of carved trees. And so the fence, the barbed wire uh, across the middle of the painting indicates uh, a history of imprisonment and in genocide. And the, um, the painting itself is interesting because there are no figures in it. Now, this painting writes back to a, a painting by H. J. Thompson, printed in 1880, for Evening Shadows, Backwater of the Murray, in South Australia. Now, twice upon a time, writes back to Johnson in a memory so tranquil that it seems to lack the menace that uh, Barber saw central to colonial imagery, reproducing too lovingly the conventions of colonial representation. But the meta-representational aspect of painting provides the menace of disruption and subversiveness. It is a critique of colonial inscription and the policies of removal and injustice that accompany the dominance of representation. The meta-representational function of owners of art is demonstrated in a different publicist, in Jimmy's Billabong, over the picturesque visual representation of Jimmy's Billabong is the striped covering of rock cross-section designs that signify clan affiliation. The rock overlay can be interpreted as a process of indigenizing the other, of claiming custodianship of the land and of subverting the primacy of Western systems of representation. These rock patterns are important to Ernest to set up a book of rock uh, with Michael Ethan. As with the former painting, Twice upon a time, 
the meta representation of context is between the visual, oculocentric history of Western representation and the embodied construction of Aboriginal place. From 1986 until his death in 1996, Ernest made 16 spiritual pilgrimages to the Army Land. These enabled him to fill his in between space, his third space of enunciation, with a diverse array of techniques. And one example is the painting by my forest. It's a strikingly simple subversion of the landscape techniques in which the painting itself. The ambivalence of place and the perception of Western styles of scene as themselves a screen over ancestral space is demonstrated by the dukes of pieces taken out of the painting. Seeing itself as it is represented in the painting is a jigsaw that can be too easily disrupted by the removal of a couple of pieces. Now, significantly, the pieces themselves do not fit the spaces that are there for suggesting that the jigsaw of visual representation is a tenuous and provisional one that overlays other forms of seeing, other forms of engagement with place. So this jigsaw motif is uh, continued in Arab Hubert Swamp. The realist Western landscape style is punctuated with cutouts through which one could view a traditional bark painting continuing below. The painting represents the re-inscription and interpenetration of Aboriginal and Western forms of representation. Ernest uses the traditional idiom of conceptual art in the landscape tradition with the fish, frogs and animals painted in Aboriginal conventions. This bricolage technique is a new dimension to the concept of a hybrid. For a painting is not simply a pattern of different forms but a dialectic of different ways of seeing. Again, we can see that it is a very fact of difference that Ernest's meta-representation of style aims for. There's no attempt to transport the viewer into the cosmology signified by the Aboriginal pattern, but the difference represented within the space of the single painting can be seen as the ground of reconciliation. Now, I talked about language, literature, and the visual language of art in communicating difference, in relating difference, in building relatedness. But I want to talk about something a little bit more esoteric in context. Material, something I call material resonance. The possibility of knowing before interpretation. How do we know what we know? Already we've seen examples of verbal and visual language in which difference can be related. But how might difference be related in the unnameable? We already get a sense of that in Ernest's painting, where the sense of something behind the representation gives us a sense without explanation of a different culture. Is it perhaps the price of language, a written language in particular, exacts from experience? While it divides us with an intersubjective world, it places limits on the world. As Wittgenstein says in the last line of the Tractatus, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. This is sage advice of philosophers, but what does it mean to poets? T.S. Eliot says, on the other hand, the poem is a thing itself, and should be enjoyed even for its understood. While Stevens captures the same thought in his poem, not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself, in which a bird's cry at sunrise is like a new knowledge of reality. But the question I'm asking is what kind of knowing may exist before or outside understanding? It's precisely that whereof the unsaid, whereof one cannot speak, that concerns me because it's the resonance of the unsaid and unsayable that both enriches and mystifies the cultural object. 
Aboriginal writer Aileen Morton Robinson makes a terrific claim that the Aboriginal relationship to the land is an ontological one that white people can never share. No one would dispute that. But how useful are such stereotypes? Would this relationship lie in a continuum of different Aboriginal people themselves? What happens when we delve into the space between the ontological polarities of white and Aboriginal relationship to place? Can we understand that which we cannot share? Can we know before we understand? And if so, what is it to know in this way? Clearly, to even ask these questions is begin to reconfigure our idea of epistemology. Well, the first question, that's colonial writing, shows us categorically that understanding is not to be confused with a shared experience. Indeed, the relating difference need not even demand understanding of the other. But the second question is much more challenging. To what extent does the creative object, or more broadly the creative act itself, intimate a form of knowing? To what extent is this form of knowing something that exists beyond the cognitive in the effective response of the body? Does a poem or any other work of art communicate before it's understood? Does such communication take us beyond epistemology into the body? If so, how does transcultural communication proceed before understanding? Now, I will pass over an example in the interest of time uh, to talk about I'll, I'll talk, I'll pass over uh, David Lewis' novel, but just briefly, uh, what he suggests is that uh, there is a, a sense of experience of, of knowing the country before understanding of the, of the first settlers who arrived in, um, uh, in Australia. I want to talk about something called the production of presence. Uh, now, this uh, comes about through Hans Ulrich Lundberg's book, Production of Pre Presence, which challenges a broadly institutionalized tradition, according to its interpretation, that is, the identification and or attribution of meaning is the core practice, the exclusive core practice of the humanity. Now, interpretation is so institutionalized in the humanities that we can take its core function for granted. And I think we'd all agree with that. We're all into, into the business of interpretation. But Boombrecht had a dissatisfaction with this that arose from the sense that uh, materialities of communication were completely ignored in the humanities. The term materialities of communication refers to the idea that different media affect the meaning they carry. The production of presence implies that the tangible effects of the particular communication media, sound, print, computer screen, for instance, will affect the meaning. And this production of presence will occur in any form of communication in which its material elements will touch the bodies of the persons communicating. Now, Gumbach does not mean a in this. The materiality of the artwork was a feature of the zero group of uh, uh, school of painting, and particularly Lucio Fontana's, uh, whose tagli paintings, in which the canvas was slashed to emphasize the material surface of the artwork, seemed to urge the viewer to engage with the pre and the muting materiality of art. Indeed, more than urging the violence of Fontana's abuse of the canvas, canvas shocks us into recognition of the materiality of art. Now, such materiality also provides a pathway to engagement with the other. Unlike Leonardo's painting, which offers a meta-representational narrative, uh, in Islamic art offers a link between the viewer and religious reality. Religion <coughs> being perhaps the most resistant to knowledge of the outside of that. And one after Hurst, Einstein, Smith, 
most in need of a way of putting things agreeable to all. Art then provides one form of material resonance, one form of knowing before understanding, knowing before interpretation. And it occurred to me, with staying here, that the sounds of the call to prayer offer a, diff a, a similar form of knowing beyond understanding, knowing before understanding, a form of presence which uh, puts us into the space of the other and enables us to know before we even understand. Um, however, having said this, the textual materiality that seems most evocative in the domain it is the domain of music, whether situated in the performance of text, whether in music itself or the musicality of language. Indeed, I'm tempted to call this particular quality the music of the text, along the lines of Aldous Huxley, who's, who claimed that after silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. But to cover the range of textual formations in which this may occur, we call this the material resonance of music. Material resonance occurs in written, audible, and visual texts, but it may be present in other sensory stimuli as well, such as touch and smell. Uh, it's obviously most pronounced in the auditory impact of music itself. Well, it's uh, the thing about this it is carried by an apple, but it's not identical with it. More importantly, presence may be the point at which true dialogue begins, because in Huntington's terms, true dialogue occurs when the difference of the other is recognised. When production of presence becomes central in understanding post-colonial aesthetic space, is in a suggestion that there are ways of experiencing, responding to, of understanding the world apart from structures of meaning, that is, apart from the kind of interpretation that can be fixed in language. The fact that these moments can be suggested in art, music, and especially literature is an important discovery. But the concept of presence privileges the aesthetic moment. There exists in this moment a non-cognitive apprehension of what we might call a form of knowing that lies beyond interpretation. So the engagement with cross-cultural text um, occurs in a trans-cultural space, a contact zone in which reader and writer functions meet. But there is an elaboration of the power of all literature to present the luminous effects of its materiality. But what of reading? If text is constitutive, how can readers approach the text in a different way to engage with presence? Like viewers at an art exhibition, readers are surrounded by a great deal of noise, both positive and negative, concerning Aboriginal creative production. Should readers be open to the beyond of meaning, ready to enjoy before understanding, to be open to the material resonance of the text? before interpretation. Indeed, there is a way of being open to the text without representing a way of not thinking that hardly recalls the last one. This is, this becomes very obvious when we examine this concept. It's an ideal admonition to engage in a form of meditation without being an attitude of being open. It's what he refers to as releasement and what we could also interpret as being composed and simply waiting to know that which lies beyond meaning, the releasement towards things, and openness to the mystery of difference, is a particularly important uh, function of the communication, the relating of difference between cultural realities that we find in post-colonial context. Difference is more than diversity. It may be related within the language itself, within the transcultural space of the literary text. It may be related in visual language and ultimately in the resonance of the material object. But in every case, difference may only be rate related within a relationship. In post-colonial cultural reduction, 
this is a relationship in which all parties are changed. And in this way, art and literature produce what Ernst Bloch calls Vorschein, or anticipatory illumination, by which these things enable us to imagine a different world. Thank you very much. <laughs>